so what I wanted to do was um, I wanted to run through a, kind of a little bit of a review of what's going on with the ADD converter and uh, a revisitation of the um, generation of waveforms uh, to uh, the DAC. So this is a little bit of a continuation from uh, our last exciting um, uh, class. And what I wanted to do was um, uh, kind of run through for you this basic idea that what we had done in the past was we had used a loop to um, read from our wavetable and then proceeded to output to the DAC. This time we're going to do the exact same thing with a difference. And the difference is we're going to specify the exact sample rate for reading from the wavetable and outputting to the DAC. In order to accomplish this, I have included the, uh, the timer one library. And uh, what you can do, uh, if you wanna ever look for libraries, is you can go under include library and you can click on manage libraries. And then if you um, uh, get a, um, a little filter, your search uh, text area, just click into there and then you can proceed to type in something like timer. And then you can see what's been installed and what hasn't been. Actually, maybe I should type in timer, timer one. And let me just make sure I got the name right. Oh, got to spell it out. <coughs> timer one, and there it is. So this is a timer one rev 11 installed. Here's another timer one. I'm using this one right now, timer one rev 11. I don't know much about the other one. Um, and, um, What I did was um, when I um, proceeded to do my, uh, my setup is I said timer one initialized to 100 microseconds and then timer one attach interrupt DAC sample. And what this does is it lets me sample the DAC, um, well, sample the waveform and output it to the DAC every 100 microseconds as part of an interrupt that's triggered every 100 microseconds. I thought that was a particularly easy way in which to manipulate the timers. And that sort of handles a lot of complexity in the background about setting timer control registers, which is effectively all it does. I've looked at the code. It's quite extensive. It doesn't seem to compile at all in the Tinkercad, which is really unfortunate because I, I, I tried like crazy to get that timer one ported over to Tinkercad, but I just couldn't do it. Um, Tinkercad apparently is not as faithful a simulator as we might like. Uh, so there are limits to simulators. Um, in any case, um, sampling every 100 microseconds means sampling every 10, well, means sampling at 10 kilohertz is what it means. And then what I did was um, I attached this so-called DAC sample. And so in DAC sample, I uh, started by saying, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sampling during an interrupt. And the last thing I need is for something else to interrupt me during the sample. So I called on no interrupts and that blocks out all the other interrupts that might occur so that I can focus on getting this sample done um, uh, once every uh, 100 microseconds. And then um, I proceeded to go through the sign table just like before and um, output it to the DAC. Um, and here is a, a value which I got from my analog read over in here in the loop. And that'll update whenever it updates. I mean, that might take time. Um, it might be in a wait mode waiting for an analog device to read. I don't know how long it will take to do the analog. I think the default is uh, 9.6 kilohertz. Uh, whatever it is, uh, I don't care because I'm gonna make sure that my sampling for the audio occurs on time without interrupt every 100 microseconds. So th this is kind of the real-time approach to programming, which um, is basically not covered at all in any other programming course uh, that you might have in the, um, uh, well, might, might take from campus as far as I know, with the possible exception of um, Digital Design 2, where they teach VHDL. So this is, this is a fairly time-sensitive thing. And what we really want to do is we want to specify exactly how fast our DAC will sample. And in fact, when we get to the point of doing signal processing where we're taking a sample of data coming in from an ADD converter and then outputting a sample to the DAC, 
that's the kind of thing you might like to do um, all at once so that you can have uniform sampling on input and output. Because the last thing you want to do is have a DAC that samples at a different rate from your ADD converter if you're in the middle of some kind of a process that requires real-time input. So it's really good to know things like, I'm going to run at a sample rate of exactly 10 kilohertz. That has implications in terms of your frequency response, right? Because what happens is you have to think in terms of the sample rate of the DAC being twice the highest fundamental frequency you can possibly detect. And the reason why is because of the Nyquist theorem, which says you have to sample at exactly twice the rate of the highest fundamental frequency. That includes partials, that is the uh, harmonics of the frequency that you're interested in, in detecting. So that means I can't go up any higher than uh, perhaps, um, um, well, the maximum uh, fundamental frequency would be five kilohertz. I must, I must be below five kilohertz um, when, I, when I do my synthesis when, uh, and, or when I do my sampling off of the wavetable. Um, and that's important. And we need to know that because if we uh, know how many samples we're taking from the wavetable, we can divide that uh, number of samples into the uh, 10 kilohertz and we'll be able to compute exactly what the frequency is of the uh, periodic generator um, when we go to create our sine wave. In other words, if you told me I have 10,000 samples, um, that wouldn't be good, right? Because then if I'm sampling at 10 kilohertz, um, I'm basically outputting one full period every second or something. It just doesn't make sense, right? So, so you have to figure out uh, N, in our case, I think it was 128. If you sampled every one of those um, elements, uh, you would have to take um, 10, uh, 10 kilohertz sample rate, which is, um, I'm just using this calculator now, and divide by um, 128. And if you sampled every single sample, you'd be outputting a, um, a waveform at 78 hertz. So that's not particularly high in value, um, but that's the lowest frequency I could go. And then um, probably end up being somewhat higher, right? Because you actually want to think in terms of, um, uh, you know, giving it a little headroom. So I can't go any higher than f four kilohertz, that's for sure. Probably can't go any lower in frequency than 78 hertz, uh, given, given N. And now I can... Um, uh, proceed to um, try and give a demo. Let's see if this works. So you can you could probably hear that now, and then I'll just sort of sweep the. Uh, what are you changing with the sweep? Uh, I'm changing the. Um, uh, the variable resistor on the um, on the analog shield, the uh, um, the DSP shield. So that that would be what analog read is reading in, right? And what we're doing here is we're um, uh, doing a DAC sample as part of an interrupt, and we're trying to be precise about the um, the frequency of the sampling. And so that's that's the goal in all of this. And after the DAC sample is done, we we go and we re-enable the interrupts. So that that's kind of a kind of a key uh, element here in our in our uh, system. And what I did was I created a little bit of a demo using an oscope on an iPad. In the um, and I took that demo and I turned it into a Vimeo, and then I took the Vimeo and I posted it up to the microprocessors. Um, um, page and now I think maybe you can find the um, uh, the iPad oscope here Let's see if that works now why does it come out sideways I don't understand that at all isn't that bizarre it was not sideways when I recorded it it was front ways so that, that highest frequency, which you could see right up in here, uh, that's 4,998 4, hertz. And then we're going to go down in frequency. And you can see the frequency is being measured here sideways. 
Why is it sideways? I can't understand it. I mean, that's bizarre, right? Why would it do that? And I'm, I'm, of course, I'm coupling the speaker with the microphone on the iPad. So there's bound to be some distortion. But here you can see it looks like a really steady as a rock sine wave. You can't get that with normal oscopes. And here's the frequency as it is registered by the, um, by the interpreter. So that's kind of interesting. So why was it looking um, a little wiggly when uh, in certain frequencies or certain, um, you know, variable resistor there is? Not sure. That's a good question. Uh, uh, so, so um, yeah, how come it doesn't look like a pure sine wave? Well, let's think about this. We're going through a speaker. We're coming in on a microphone. It's not exactly an, a proper way to set up a piece of test equipment. I was, was sort of thinking about different ways to, um, to do this with software oscilloscopes. And, um, you know, I think, I think we had an issue like that with, um, with the software oscilloscope here on, on lab, um, lab six. Let's take a look. So this was, this was uh, coming in on um, the Windows uh, computer. Let's see if we can't um, get this to uh, speed up a little bit. You could probably do it in the settings of this video. So there it is. It's not quite, e even on the Windows computer here, and, and it's kind of loud and obnoxious. Um, and uh, Professor, do you remember uh, when I was in the lab and we actually used the male-to-male -male audio auxiliary cable? I do remember that. We didn't see this there, No, right? no, we did. Yeah, we did. Did we? Yeah, even on the oscilloscope we did. But on the oscill oscilloscope, it was more of a... Uh, it looked like a like a pulse or a step instead. Of yeah, that's around. right. You are going to have a pulse or a step because you're skipping around in the waveform by incrementing the index register. You're not synthesizing a wave, a sine wave at a different frequency. What you're doing is you're jumping through the wavetable of a sine wave with different jump increments. That's not the same as resynthesizing a sine wave. So it's likely you're going to get um, a, a slightly different uh, waveform if you're jumping from one sine wave step to the other. So maybe that's an answer. I, I could have tried to synthesize these things in um, uh, how you say real time using the trig function, but I, I don't think that's a good way to go for sine waves. If you want to do a real time synthesis of a waveform, do something like um, uh, a sawtooth wave. And the sawtooth wave, it's just incrementing by one until you get to the top and then you drop it to zero. And then you can synthesize that without using trig functions at all. And you don't have to worry about using multiple CPU cycles to compute something like a trig function because uh, that stuff is double precision floating point and there's no way your little 8-bit toaster controller is gonna do that in one CPU cycle. But an increment, now, an increment, that's different. That it can do in one CPU cycle, not a problem. So that, that's, a, um, that's a pretty easy way to go if you wanted to do something like that. Instead of outputting sine waves, you could output a sawtooth wave. And then you can get rid of all of this stuff about the sine tables and init sign. And when you do these um, outputs, well, really all you want is to... Um, Output your index, I suppose, and then make the index equal to, uh, well, you probably want to change the code quite a bit. Because uh, we, we've set up n. I would like to say let, let the index go to from 0 to n, where n is perhaps 128. Yeah. So if you want to go, wanted that to go to 1,000, um, a, a um, let's see, 4,095. 4096, then take 4096, divide it through by 128, and get a number like 32. So if you um, wanted the output to be equal to index times 32, um, then you wouldn't need the sign table.
wonder if you need times index. Instead of times 32, if I times, that would be times four, times eight, times 16, times 32, right? So that's, a, that's shifting index over to the left. Um, that's going to be done in one CPU cycle. And so um, the shift will take precedent. The index will get shifted. Output will um, increment 128 times. And then, let's see. What else do I need to do? Index is resetting itself whenever it gets to N. Oh gosh, I don't know, that might work. It did it, I did it. What does that sound like? Oh, it's not working, oh, embarrassing. Well, life in the big city. I'm not quite sure why that didn't work. That sounded like something that should have worked, right? Wait, can we see that again? Let's do times 32 instead, just in case I had a brain fart. Oh, I forgot to uh, reset the, um, the Arduino after the upload. That, that actually is really obnoxious. So that's, um, that probably would have worked then had I remembered to um, reset the Arduino after the upload. Hmm. Let's see. Ah, let's give it a go. That's, that's totally obnoxious. It's running the last code, is it not? It's running who? The last code. Uh, when oh, did we, did we not there. upload? I thought it said done uploading. It did, but um, sometimes the Arduino just doesn't accept the code and just runs the past one, I think. No, I, I don't think that's true. No, okay. It must be that. So, um, obnoxious uh, waveform number 10. Uh, so there you go. Uh, so that'll get you that instead of the sine wave. And then you don't have to worry about jumping around um, on sine tables. You can just continuously uh, in increment your, um, your sawtooth wave. But that is not um, a great way to go, I think, if you don't like the way sawtooth waves. So... Uh, Tooth waveform hack. There's my sawtooth waveform hack. So that's a um, analog read. That's going to do stop and wait protocol in the main loop. Um, but we don't have to worry too much about how long that takes since we've got this DAC sample happening. Now, uh, last time we were looking at um, uh, ADD converters, and you can see I've changed the volume somewhat over in here. This was, this is actually so loud that I was afraid I was going to blow my speakers. So I turned, I cranked it down. Um, I used this uh, init A to C uh, to gain access directly to uh, registers. And so we had reviewed what happens when we start to manipulate these um, ADC um, uh, status registers at the bit level. Um, and so, um, what I wanted to do was kind of point out um, some nice ways in which you can set up your code to make it a little bit more readable. And so I worked kind of hard making this as readable as I could possibly make it. Um, you can have up to 16 A to D inputs depending upon which Arduino you're at. So there's the least significant four bits available in the A to D MUX. And what you want to do is figure out which, you know, A to D you want and then mask it with the least significant four bits. And this sets, um, the analog uh, input to be zero, but you can make this um, uh, one, two, three, four, 
or five as well. So that gives you six inputs on your Uno. And then um, what you wanna do, sorry, I've got this uh, phone ringing. I've gotta silence it now. They only call me when I'm in class. Um, so what you wanna do is uh, then look at your reference voltage inputs and you can change that. And um, what I've done in here is I'm using the um, uh, reference zero uh, REF zero is being set to one. And so that says I'm gonna use the um, VCC with an external capacitor at the um, analog reference pin. So that's saying he wants inputs that go from zero to five volts, but I could change it to use the internal reference of, which is a precision 2.56 volts. And um, if I did that, then I would have to say 80 max or equals, and then I'd have to do ref zero and ref one. So if I wanted the um, 2.4 volt version, I might do something like this. And that would be the um, 2.56 volt ref setting instead of the five volt reference setting. I mean, if you had a guitar going in and you know it was gonna be like one volt peak to peak, this might be a little bit more appropriate than the other one. So kind of have to figure out which you're doing. Uh, the other bits for the 80 mux, um, there's this thing called left adjust and you can left or right adjust uh, your 10 bits. And so here, if you're gonna left adjust your, ten, your eight of the 10 bits and you just want those most significant eight bits, you left adjust them. And then um, you can proceed to sample them just by reading uh, ADCH and setting it equal to your high bits, your eight bits, most significant eight bits. And that's good if you only need eight bits of precision, which is probably fine for our little volume indicator. Um, then you wouldn't need to do something like shifting things to the right twice. I don't know if you noticed this in the, um, in the DAC sample, but we're always shifting to the right. But that's because we're assuming that the value is coming in as a 10-bit value. And it's being read in however long it takes to read from analog read. But instead, if you wanted to do something precision with precision, um, you can essentially say, look, I'm just going to digitize the first um, eight bits, I'll shift it over, and then I'm gonna grab it using um, ADCH, and it'll give me the high bits, the high eight bits, and then I'll be done. Then comes the, um, uh, the interesting thing about the prescaler. So we've got a 16 megahertz clock going into a, um, a prescaler, which essentially is a divider, and it divides down by integral powers of two from two to 128. And when you do that, um, you basically take an approx a successive approximation ADD converters conversion register and you power it with the divided down version of the system clock. So for example, um, if you had a, um, a divide by two on a 16 megahertz crystal, your successive approximation register is getting an eight megahertz signal. If you know it takes you 13 cycles to do a conversion. Then you take that eight megahertz and divide by 13, and you get like this number right in through here, 0.615385 megahertz, which is not exactly right, but that's close. And then that's how many hertz it is. And if you round it up, it's a 615 kilohertz sample rate. So, so what happens with your prescaler is you can change your sample rate. I happen to think 615 kilohertz sample rate is um, much, much too fast for anything I wanna do with signal processing. So what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll use a prescaler of something like 128, just slow everything down. Um, and what that does is it gives me a, a sample rate of 100, and, well, it gives me a clock frequency for the input to the successive approximation ADD converter of 125 kilohertz. And if I take that 125 kilohertz and divide through by 13 cycles per conversion, then I get to 9.6 kilohertz 
which is a nice slow rate for something like the diddle pot that you plan on turning because you're not going to turn your diddle pot at 9.6 kilohertz, almost, almost certainly. And then what you want to do is you want to figure out how to set those bits. So here it is, bit 0, 1, and 2. I'm sorry, yeah, 0, 1, and 2 are three bits um, from uh, left to right. And you can see they're ADS, ADPS0, ADPS1, and ADPS2. And so what you do is if you said, you only know, want to set ADPS0, right, what that does is it sets this bit and gives you a divide by two clock. If I want to set ADPS1, which is there, then that gives you the divide by four. And here's how you get your divide by eight. Um, that's going to set um, both ADPS 1 and 0. There's 1 and 0. ADPS just 2, that'll give you a divide by 16. So here's just 2 by 16. And so that's a nice way to go because you're, you're setting the bits all at once and you're doing it surgically without using the so-called SBI and CBI or set bit and clear bit invocations. And these are all being preset as constants. And then you just have to select for one and say, look, I'll, I'll go to my ADC um, uh, control register and I'll just set to 128 as my divide down. And if I divide by 128 on a 16 megahertz clock, I know I'm gonna go at 125 kilohertz for my sample, um, my successive approximation um, ADD converters register input and therefore divide by 13, I'll have a 9.6 kilohertz conversion rate. Then the other thing you wanna do is set it up so that it auto triggers. Now that auto trigger means it's gonna free run. It's gonna convert as fast as it can at 9.6 kilohertz, and then it'll generate an interrupt. And now you have to worry, oh, gee, is this going to interrupt my ability to output to the DAC? And the answer is no, because during that period of time, you're going to say no interrupts. And if what that means is you lose an ADD converter input as a result, because you're in the middle of a non-interruptible um, service, you won't care that much because you're really just going to get it the next time around. And so what that means is um, it, it's kind of okay since it's a manual input that your stuff is interrupt driven and you've got, you'll be in the middle of something that can't be interrupted. So you kind of have to really be thoughtful about how you mask interrupts because otherwise you're gonna miss it, perhaps important events, but having a human being do a diddle pot is not that urgent an event as opposed to outputting to the DAC, which is a higher priority item. So you really have to think about why you want to have um, the interrupts turned off. And so then if you enable interrupts over in here, um, and then you enable your ADD converter, and then you say, okay, you start free, free um, uh, running and, and convert whenever you can, and then generate an interrupt, what happens is you'll get an, a, um, an inversion of control. When the interrupt occurs, when the, DAC, when the ADD converter is done converting, it'll call interrupt service routine ISR with the ADC vector, and what you're going to do is you're just going to grab the most significant eight bits because you've already shifted things to the left by eight bits. You put it into your value instead of what's here in the loop where we said something on the order of um, analog read. And so then what that's going to do is it'll uh, keep that value up to date. You'll be able to use the value when you proceed to do things like set DX. And so then in, in theory, uh, the only thing you have to do to switch from the manual analog read, which runs however long it runs in, to something that runs only when it's done converting is you would comment something like this out. You probably don't need your micros, but you don't need any of that. And now, you want to um, invoke init ADC as part of your setup, right? Because now you're setting things up to work on uh, as an interrupt driven um, ADD converter. And so 
This is the part of the code that I just got to this morning. I was going to test it before I started class, and I didn't quite get that far. So here we're sort of just trying things for the first time. You know what I'll do is I'll initialize this ADC before I start this timer. So we'll initialize the sign, initialize the ADC, and cross my fingers and hope this works. Uh, let's see. So we'll upload the code. And turn on the speaker. What could possibly go wrong? Let's see. And, and, and you know what happens when you're doing things where you might interrupt a, um, a waveform generation, like a, a nice fine sine wave like this? is you'll get a glitch and you want to avoid those glitches. And that's why you want to control when outputs occur on the DAC and when interrupts uh, can and cannot occur. And so this is quite a nice because now you've got, uh, let me turn this down now because it's annoying. Um, so now you've got uh, a nice interrupt driven system and look at this loop. There's nothing in here. And you can, you can kind of do, I don't know, whatever you want to in this loop. And, it, and, and because everything is interrupt driven, the loop will run however fast it runs, but it won't be a priority task. So if I just said something important like, um, I don't know what to do, serial.println Mickey Mouse is my hero. You can tell I don't know what to do. So um, what we'll do, while well, Mickey Mouse is my hero, is, um, oh, maybe we can output here. Serial.println val. And then we'll put in a space or perhaps a colon there. And then, uh, Let's see if we can get a clean sine wave, even though we have all this printing going on. Because normally that printing would interrupt a whole bunch of stuff. So this is printing at how, what speed? Serial begin 250 kilobits per second. That is, that is way fast, right? It's as fast as I could envision this thing running. Let's see how it sounds. I hope it doesn't sound awful. And so we've got all these things going on in the background. A to D converters are happening. Printing is happening. And, um, and it's all because we're, you know, interrupting things and we're interrupt driven. And it looks like it's multitasking, but it's really not. It's carefully dividing its attention between the high priority task, which is the output to the DAC, the lower priority task, which is um, read from the A to D converter, and the lowest priority task, which is output something to the serial port. Now, outputting to the serial port, you know, says it's fast, right? 250, whatever this is, kilobits, kilobit. Uh, but the problem is that's still really, really slow compared with a 16 megahertz computer. And in fact, if you think about it, I could probably change this to be, I don't know, something really slow, like 9600 baud. And then, um, and then what? And then upload it again, I suppose. And it should still run properly in theory, I hope. Oh, he says it's done uploading. Let's go to the um, serial monitor and, and, and check the, um, the board rate, 9600. It's got a match, you know. And um, you can see how slow it's printing. Oh my God, it's so slow. But it doesn't matter to me because Everything else is running nice and fast in the background. And it doesn't matter that the serial port is doing whatever it's doing, however slow it may be. In fact, I think it sounds even better when the serial port is running slower because it's taking 
far less time from the Arduino to do its, its little um, printing thing. So that's, um, that's a kind of multitasking. It's not really multitasking, I guess. Interrupt-driven real-time programming. That's what it is. And that's what we're doing. So um, the key, we did a timer attachment. We're doing a sampling. If we wanted to sample at 125 microseconds, which is the same sample rate as the A to D converter, we could do that simply by typing it in there. And um, not to put too fine a point on it, um, but if I took um, one, two, five times 10 to the minus six, and then uh, rose, raise that to the minus one power, I get a number that's eight kilohertz. So 125, it's not quite the same as what I expected. What did we say we were gonna go at? 9.6 kilohertz? So how are we getting that? That's uh, 16 megahertz divided by 128. So that gives me a number of 125 kilohertz. 125 kilohertz divided by 13 gives me 9.6 kilohertz. 9.6 kilohertz uh, times 10 to the three. Oh, I got that wrong. Well, let's see. We'll do it again. Uh, 16 divided by 128 is uh, 125 kilohertz divided by 13 is giving me um, 9.6 kilohertz. What I wanted to know was what is the period for 9.6 kilohertz? So if I raise it to the minus one power, the period is um, 104 microseconds. That might be that might be right. So um, so I need 104 microseconds. Let's see if that's true. 16,000 divided by 104 gives me um, no. That's not right. What is what is um, what is the frequency for 104 microseconds? That would be 16. Ah, 104 microseconds is 104 times 10 to the minus six seconds, right? Raise that to the minus one power and it gives you 9,615 hertz, which is 9.6 kilohertz. So what you really want, if you wanna match the A to D converter sampling rate with the output on your DAC is you wanna to go to 104 microseconds. That is 9.6 kilohertz. So now the DAC is gonna match the sample rate of the A to D converter in theory. And what does that sound like? Just out of curiosity. That's cool. So if instead of digitizing um, a slowly moving waveform, we wanted to digitize something that was relatively quick, like um, an analog input, this would be a way to do it, even though the um, A to D converter is running um, free running, because at least the inputs and outputs would be roughly equal in rate, if not synchronized. So that's the, um, that's the code. What do you think of that? Is it, is it more clear now because of, um, you know, this, this structure gives you all the different possible um, prescalers. That's what the PS is for, by the way, it stands for prescaler. And so that gives you an opportunity to essentially assign all the different features you can assign to the A to D converter and to give it um, uh, that ability to give you that eight bits uh, whenever it's done.
enabling an interrupt. So I thought that was pretty cool. It gets you um, kind of deeper into the, um, into the timer-based systems. So that's, that was, that's the new code for today. Thought you might like to see that. Um, now we have a homework due on Thursday next, and I think it's homework number six. Isn't that right? You guys, um, you guys are a silent bunch. So I'll just bring it up. So there's your homeworks. And here is homework number six, and that's on the ADD converter. So we kind of reviewed the ADD converter a little bit again just now. So that's cool. And uh, if you wanted to, you could see the uh, options on the ADD converter homework. And I think it says it's due the 15th, which is, well, today's the 12th. So, um, that's got to be Wednesday, right? No, Thursday. Thursday, end of day. So that's, that's, that's good. And so you guys uh, have an opportunity now to ask me questions about homework six. Well, let's take a look at it together and see if there's anything here that we need to um, try to address. Actually, you know what? This is not showing me the whole homework. Let's go back. Um, let's do, I'll do this. Um, Let's do edit. I think that's easier. So I can see that. Let me um, let me ask. Did you guys have any questions about homework? About the homework. Homework six. No, no questions. So, so hearing no questions about homework six, I guess I can go over uh, homework, um, well, the next homework, which would be homework number seven. You sure you have no questions about homework six? On the ADD converter? One sec. Well, what we'll do, let's, let's do this. I'll, I'll pretend I'm a student and I'm just going to hit begin. So let's take a look at this. Um, we've got this thing here called the baud rate, which is defined in a constant. And it uh, looks like um, we're printing out something in ASCII for a sensor value. So that's interesting. I mean, what, what's that about? And so sensor values are coming in um, I would guess as integers, here they are, it's an integer for sure, and then we're sending it out as ASCII. So to send it as ASCII, uh, we do a serial print line and then we're telling it to do a backslash R. What's that mean? What's a backslash R? Anybody know about these things? Backslash R is a carriage return, in case you were wondering. So in other words, what happens in, in, um, in various platforms as you go from Unix to the Mac to Windows is they use various different ways to terminate a new line. So you can't rely upon a print line to do what you want it to do for certain devices. If what you want to do, for example, the SIR1 robots use ASCII on an RS-232 line they want a carriage return. They want that backslash R in there. And if you're on a computer that only outputs a line feed or outputs a, a line feed and a carriage return, then it's essentially uh, confusing the, the microcontroller. And so what you wanna do is be explicit about what you need in order to start a new line. And that's usually device specific. Um, whereas when somebody says print line, it'll do the right thing for the console on that device. It'll print a new line, no doubt. But um, if the input is waiting to receive a proper carriage return, 
you want to include a proper carriage return in there. So that's, um, that's what that's about. So then when you look at like the ASCII value for carriage return, it's an ASCII 13. So that's not a visible character, except by the virtue of the fact that it does a carriage return. Historically, the reason you want a carriage return and then a line feed is because if you have a mechanical or let's say an electromechanical um, typewriter known as a teletype, it takes a long time for the carriage to return to the beginning of the line because it's physically moving a long distance. Whereas advancing the platen to get another line of paper forward doesn't take much time. So you put in carriage return first and then line feed. That's where that came from. And that's why you have some computer text files being stored with both a carriage return and a line feed or just a line feed or just a carriage return. And the three different conventions are handled differently on three different platforms, Mac, Unix, and Windows. And that's really annoying, especially for people who are moving text files back and forth because they lose the carriage returns as they go. Oftentimes, Notepad and WordPad are at odds with one another as a result. So, so when you look at something like, you know, this uh, prints data to the serial port as a human readable, ASCII text followed by a carriage return, and a new line character. Is, that, is it true or false? And, and the answer is false. It doesn't, you know, the, back, the backslash R only does one thing. It creates the carriage return. So here comes another question. Let's see, send binary. So we saw the send binary thing, and now it looks like it's um, taking value low byte and then taking value high byte and writing it out to the serial port. And so um, it's doing it as, as a, uh, I would call it numeric values, one byte at a time. This is how we send ASCII to the serial port. And this is, this is how we send the numeric values out to the serial port in binary. So that's an interesting point, right? Because, well, binary is a more efficient way to do transmission over a serial line. So if we're wanting to send values as binary, breaking them up into the low and high bytes might make sense, especially if we know we only need two bytes. And if we do send things out in binary, um, we don't necessarily have to send out carriage returns each time. You can send a large binary blob out to the serial port. And that's kind of a good thing to be able to do because um, sending the binary blob out to the serial port might be a good way to communicate to the host some binary data. You know that in the past when we were doing plotting, we were always sending out a carriage return or else the plot wasn't going to work. But here we can send out binary and perhaps it's uh, more efficient than sending ASCII. If you send ASCII and you want the numbers, then you've got to parse every integer, which is, you know, that's, that is the case. So, so you guys tell me, is it true or false? We use send binary because it's more efficient at binary transmission than send ASCII. Is that true? Yes. Yes. Yes, it is. That is true. Thank you. So here's another one, question three. Um, there's the analog in pin. We saw how analog read was working before. Um, we can use interrupt driven stuff. What's interesting about the interrupt driven stuff is, um, you know, we can interrupt the interrupt driven stuff or we can mask out interrupts so that they don't interrupt us. Um, let's see now, is, is, is uh, analog read generally slower than an interrupt driven an, um, analog read? Are they at the same speed? Yeah, they can run at the same speed. You set, you set up the analog read in re free running mode and, and um, 
you don't have to, um, uh, you know, rely upon this as being somewhat faster. In fact, the default rate on that is 9.6 kilohertz. It's all using the same underlying hardware that we were directly manipulating before with, with the bit manipulations. So it doesn't have any inherent um, disadvantage or advantage, uh, but having something that's interrupt driven has an inherent advantage because now you can have other things running in the, in the, in the background like printing. So then it says there are a thousand microseconds in a millisecond and a million microseconds in a second. Well, what do you think of that? How, how many microseconds in a second? I'm sorry, what? How many? And how many microseconds are in a second? A million. A million, yeah. And there's a thousand milliseconds in a second. And so there's a, uh, a thousand microseconds in a millisecond. It's three orders of magnitude difference from a millisecond is three orders of magnitude slower than a microsecond. And a microsecond is six orders of magnitude um, faster than a second. So True. micros versus millis. So then there's this thing in in micros, which um, will give you the number of microseconds since the Arduino began running the current program. That's actually kind of an important thing, right? Because um, what that does is allows us to determine how fast something is running. That, that's actually important because uh, if, you have, if you have to know how fast your DAC is sampling, you might like to measure something like that. So you might say, um, oh, you know what? Let's do micros and we'll make a nice long thing called um, start equals micros, okay? And then what we'll do is um, after the DAC write occurs is, um, I'm gonna turn off this interrupt thing. We'll say um, long elapsed time is equal to um, micros minus the start. And now we can do serial dot print line conversion in end quote and paren sem. Let's get rid of the ln in there. Serial dot print line elp and print sem serial dot print line uh, space uh, micro seconds. All right, so there you go. Now we can know how fast the actual conversion is occurring. So you can sort of see what's happening here, right? Because we, wouldn't we you take want it. To, wouldn't you want to delete the second line, uh, print line, and print line? Sorry. Or you, can't. you mean no interrupts? No, no, no. You uh, do you want to? Uh, the reason you put a space in microseconds before the word wasn't it so that it would. Oh, right. We want this yeah. all on the same line. Yes, thank you. And so we probably don't need the serial printing of Mickey Mouse as my hero anymore. And now the printing is going to occur as part of this DAC sample, but because it's outside of the interrupt screening system we don't expect the uh, serial print to block uh, any of the executions. And notice the, the, the loop is completely empty here. So it's all being interrupt driven now. Now the question is how fast is that DAC running? So let's take a look. I don't really know. I want the serial port, serial monitor and it didn't print anything. What's going on? Um, hmm. It said it printed start and then it printed con. Where on earth did it? Oh, it started printing conversion in. 
and then it stopped. Gee, that's weird. Isn't that weird? That's weird. I'm going to hit restart and see if, um, huh, how about that? This is, this is unexpected behavior. Let's put it in a loop. Let's make um, the uh, ELP long a, um, a global. And that's the elapsed time. I'll set it equal to zero. Uh, what we'll do is um, we'll go into the interrupt service routine and we will put this in our loop. See what happens here. I think you returned from the interrupt as soon as I um monitor is still up on the back right there. The monitor is up here. Oh, eight microseconds. That's pretty good, actually. So you just have to declare ELP the LP value and then why would you put it in the loop then? I put it in a loop so the loop could have access to it. By making nice. it global, um uh it, it went beyond the scope of the DAC sample. Gotcha. In fact, I could make the start a, um, a global as well. That way you don't have to locally initialize a new variable when you enter into the interrupt service routine. It's a bit of a speed hack. So we'll make the start equal to zero. I don't think that's gonna change the rate at which this runs. The printing is so slow, it probably got interrupted by the um, ADD converter. So there we go. It's, it's, it's running like really fast. Now, if I wanted to, I could probably change the rate, right? So um, eight microseconds, very fast. This, we could probably make why is it running in eight microseconds? I thought it should run a little bit slower than that. Um, hmm. That's interesting, isn't it? 150 microseconds is the timer. Oh, he's not, he's not telling us how fast he's being invoked. He's telling us how fast he's doing the conversion. So he could indeed be, be um, he could indeed be invoked every hundred microseconds and when he's invoked the entire subroutine only takes eight microseconds so that's fine that's exactly what that's exactly right it's what you'd expect right because why writing to the DAC takes as long as it takes but how fast you write to the DAC is different than how often you write to the DAC so it takes you eight microseconds to do the uh, uh, to do the actual write but you're doing it once every hundred microseconds. So every hundred microseconds, you take eight microseconds out of your day and right out to the, um, right out to the DAC. So that's pretty cool, actually. And the conversion is actually very consistent here. So that's good to know. And it shows you how to do the benchmarking. So that's, that's actually quite educational. So now we have, um, the number of microseconds since the Arduino began running, the current program on a 16 mic uh, megahertz Arduino board, it has a resolution of four microseconds. So this is eight microsecond conversion time plus or minus four microseconds, right? So it could be four microseconds, it could be 12, right? It's, it's, that's a substantial error when you're down to the microsecond um, resolution. And so that's that's true, actually. And it's kind of kind of an interesting idea, right? Because if you said, well, let's see, I wonder how what the frequency is for four microseconds. So it's four times ten to the um, minus six, right? Then take that number and raise it to the minus one power, and what do you get? And um, yeah, we don't get sixteen million. 
So why he, we get a number that's like 250,000? That's weird. So four microseconds, let's see, if I have 16, let's see, four divided by one, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then raise it to the minus one power, I get, yeah, 250,000. So that's 250 kilohertz. So this has got some something to do with some other timer that's trying to give us information about about elapsed time. This micros is really not as as accurate as you might think. So here here's another one. I like this. This is kind of interesting. Um, I have uh, eight channels of ADD converter on some at megas, especially the mega. Yeah, the at mega is a is a little bit bigger than the Uno. Uh, they all have 10-bit resolution. If I range from zero to five volts, then I would expect an ADC value to go from zero to 123 volts, and that two and a half volts would correspond to a number 512. So that sort of makes sense. And now here comes the actual, um, uh, the refs, right? So let's take a look at the code now and see if we can relate it to the refs. So somewhere in here, we're gonna find, right through here, the refs, zero, one, two, and three in binary. And so now let's see if we can get both of these things up at the same time. And so now you hear zero, zero, a ref internal V ref is so let's see internal V ref is off. They're using the external analog reference. So you can supply a separate reference to the Arduino Uno and use that. So if you said to me, I know that I'm going to be using my favorite guitar and its input is going to be exactly zero to one volts, I could put in a one volt reference and that would be okay. And if you said to me, well, no, 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 guitar outputs are low, it's going to be plus or minus 125 millivolts, which is probably a little bit closer to the actual output of a pickup, you could use a 250 millivolt um, reference externally and give it a precision reference and it'll amplify that and, and use that for its A to D converter. So that's kind of a nice, nice feature. Uh, then here comes one where you're using um, the analog VCC, which is five volts. And then we have an internal voltage reference that goes to 2.56. And you can see where the bits are. They're in bits six and seven. And so what we're doing over in here is uh, we're setting the REF S0 to a one, which means we're gonna be using um, the VCC as our reference. So that's, that's, where that, that's where that code comes from. And then comes this other thing, which is, I, I feel like this is, um, you know, a lot of bit flipping kind of stuff, but um, here it says um, ADSP2 through zero are the actual uh, ADC inputs. So if you look at down and through here, ADPS2 through zero, you can see where these numbers zero, give us um, our prescaler. So let's take a look at the prescaler again. This PS is for prescaler. And now we can see ADPS0 um, being set to a one is gonna give us a divide by two. And so here it is being set to a one and it gives us a divide by two. In fact, if we set it to a zero, it's gonna be a divide by two because that's the minimum we can use for our prescaler is divide by two. So that's kind of an interesting thing. So now you've got all your divide stuff in there. So that, that's how we kind of started the, um, you know, the lecture. We said, oh, well, let's take a look at all the different possible prescalers. And then there's this um, ADSC thing going on. And there it is here, and that starts the conversion. Here's ADEN, 
It's just the enable, and sure enough, we've got ADEN, and we have to enable. And that, you know, that's bit flipping inside of this control register. Uh, then comes ADIE, enable interrupts, and um, that is bit three. And what we'll do is we'll look for ADIE, and here it is. ADC interrupt enable. When this bit is set to one, the ADC interrupt is enabled, and this is used in the case of interrupt-driven ADCs. So when it's done, it's going to um, interrupt and call the, call the interrupt service routine with the ADC vector. It'll call uh, ISR with ADC vector, and we'll be able to grab out ADCH. Or if we're doing a 10-bit conversion, we'll get the other two bits from uh, ADC L. the rest of the bits. And if you've got everything left justified, your most significant eight bits will be in ADCH, and then the most significant um, two bits in ADCL um, will be uh, the rest of the 10 bits. Because you don't get a 16-bit ADD converter here. We just, we don't have that. So as much as you might like, you know, to have it, we don't have it unless you want to add the hardware, which is, I guess you could do that. Um, let's see now, what else do we need to know? So we've got the reference, we got the um, AD MUX analog inputs. Let's take a look at that. So this is the control register. Did we do the AD MUX? Yeah, we did that already. There's the AD MUX analog inputs. And let's see, I think that covers just about everything. Let's take a look at um, this code and make sure we've got it all. Ah, and here's the auto trigger, a date, auto trigger, enable. And so um, that's right in through here. Setting this to one enables auto triggering automatically every time there's a rising edge of a clock pulse. And um, that lets it free run. So here's a um, here's a series of prescaler settings. And it's sending a crystal frequency of 16 megahertz in a range of um, 50 to 200 kilohertz. What uh, prescaler of um, 128? What will that buy us? So we take the uh, 16 megahertz divided by 128, we get 125 kilohertz input into the successive approximation uh, ADD converter. That's gonna take us uh, perhaps uh, 13 cycles. So we'll divide this by 13 in order to get an actual, um, uh, an actual conversion rate. And I think it came out to be 9.6 kilohertz. But ADC clock frequency is not the same thing as ADC sample. So, so those are, that's different, right? So does it mean that the ADC clock frequency is 125 kilohertz? Well, we just kind of went through that, right? I mean, here's the um, the frequency right in through here. We take we take the prescaler, divide it into 16 megahertz crystal, and that gives us the input into the ADD converter. So that's your that's your 125 kilohertz right there. I'm not sure. Um, you guys are awake. You guys awake here? Anybody out there? Hello. Hello. Good. Good. Yeah. Wake up. So, um, right. So, um, if you have a prescaler of 128, take your 16 megahertz, divide by 128, and that'll give you the frequency for the A to C, A to D converter. And so that's 125 kilohertz. And that's, and that's true. 
you you must realize that knowing that this is true is not as important as knowing why it's true this is this is important right because because if you're going to be programming microcontrollers you're going to have to try and figure these things out for yourself it's not it's not going to be a multiple choice test when you get to industry and you start programming these things let's try um Let's try this again. So um, let's have a look at what we've got here. So here's our 128 um, prescaler, right? And we'd like to know uh, what is what is the uh, sampling sampling period. So what do we do? We take our 16 megahertz, we divide through by uh, 128, and we get a number, which is 125 kilohertz. We take our 125 kilohertz, we divide through by 13, and we get a number, and that's 9.6 kilohertz. Right? So, so 9.6 kilohertz, you want the, the period on this, it's one divided by nine six one five. I think it comes to, and um, and now uh, you can get um, sort of like the period if you want, or you know there there are a few different ways you can do this, but I'm I'm thinking, you know, you guys are going to want to know things like the period on, on uh, your sample rate, either, either the frequency of sampling or the period of sampling, one or the other. They're just sort of the inverse of one another. If, if I had 16 megahertz, another way to do this, and divided through by 128, I had 125 kilohertz. What's one divided by um, 125,000? Yeah, that's eight times 10 to the minus six. So that's eight microseconds. So, 100, so 16 megahertz divided by 128 gives us an eight microsecond period on input to the Arduino um, successive approximation ADD converter. And if you wanted to take that eight megahertz and multiply it by 13 cycles, that would be 104 microseconds. It's kind of long, actually. And if you took the 104 microseconds and um, you said, you know, 1 million divided by 104, you get 9,615 hertz, which is 9.6 kilohertz. So that's kind of how I approach that. A couple ways to do that. Hey, professor, how did you get uh, my eight microseconds again? So, so here's here's what you do. Um, if you have um, sixteen megahertz, and you divide through by one hundred and twenty-eight, that's your prescaler. Uh, that gives you a one hundred and twenty-five um, kilohertz rate, right? One divided by one hundred and twenty five one two three should give me the period, which is eight times ten to the minus six, and that's eight microseconds. Okay, thank you. So that's that's how I do that. So then here comes this um interesting bit of code the serial setup and he's giving me results of 20 microseconds and um, I've got several samples from the analog read and then several stop times and I'd like to know you know if it's being consistent as I do several samples and here I'm doing analog read and it's giving me a 20 microsecond read time and if you ever wanted to know you know how fast is that 
um, take a million. Let's see, take 20. Let's see if I can do this 20 times 10 to the minus six. That should be 20 microseconds. Raise it to the minus one power. And that gives me 50 kilohertz. Just, that's, that's, a, that's fast enough. Well, pretty fast anyway. So sometimes um, we see things are not consistent. Here it says the A to C is not consistent because micro's measurement is not that accurate. Remember, micro's is giving us numbers that are plus or minus four microseconds. And so that's why we say it could be eight, it could be four, it could be 12. You know, measuring micros is not the most accurate way to measure things uh, if we want to get down to the microsecond, because he's only accurate to within four microseconds. So it looks like the A to Z converter is not consistent. It's not consistent. Look, look, we're getting different conversion times. What's going on? Well, the micros measurement is not that accurate. And that's just, I guess, a limitation of the micros measurement, put it that way. So that's what I have for you for today. I think we got through most of uh, homework six. Hope it wasn't too tedious for you. You guys didn't have any questions, but I think it was good we covered it, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Thank you. I'm glad we did that because I, I got a sense that maybe there was stuff in here you didn't, you didn't know. And so that, that should help. And if you want, we can, we can cover it a little bit more uh, in our next exciting class. Um, and we're going to have a, uh, a lab, and I will be there in the lab physically. Um, but meanwhile, we're going to stay um, doing distance learning lectures for now. Thanks a bunch. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.